Okay, good, every, what, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Lamont. I'm the director of uh, the Weatherhead Center for International uh, Affairs. And it's my pleasure to uh, chair this session today. I am joined as a co-chair by Gocha Yurdegol, who is, uh, I will provide you an introduction with her, of her in a second, but she is the uh, co-organizer of this panel, which is organized jointly with the uh, Humboldt uh, University. And uh, the context, the broader context is uh, World Wild, Wild Week, which is organized every year by uh, the Office of the Vice Provost for International Affairs at Harvard. And in that context, we decided to propose this uh, special panel on uh, attacks against uh, LBGTQ and uh, the politics of diversity uh, in honor of coming out week, which was, uh, which is this week. So uh, uh, we have a very, very exciting panel and uh, we will introduce them to you uh, in a second. Um, so the Weatherhead uh, Forum is an, an event that brings together all the various constituencies of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs every two weeks. In the past, it has mostly showcased the research of our various units and researchers directly associated with the center. Uh, but this year, we're trying something else with a, uh, several uh, special panels around uh, events such as uh, you know, the one today, but also we'll have a panel the day after the election. So uh, the title of the panel is Rethinking Resistance Politics in Troubling Time, Transnational Queer Solidarity During uh, COVID-19. So uh, again, the co-organizer is Gocha Yardegul, and she is the director of the Institute of Social Science at uh, Humboldt University, as well as the Georg Zimmel Chair. For those of us who teach classical uh, theory for someone to have the Zimmel chair is just totally blows my mind. You're so lucky, Gocha. Uh, she's also head of the Department of Diversity and Conflict there. And she is the chair of the research cluster at the Berlin Institute of Migration and Integration Research. And recently she started co-chairing the Migration Network at the Council for European Studies with Nicole Doer, who's uh, joining us today, and Anna Kortovec. So Gocha is a, a powerhouse. She's so dynamic. She spent a year as a visiting scholar at the Weatherhead Center, where she was a member of uh, the research cluster on comparative inequality and inclusion, which is co-sponsoring uh, this session today. So uh, she, she's full of uh, plans and energy. She has published uh, on books and articles on immigrate, uh, immigrant integration, citizenship, Islam in Europe, as well as issues of uh, Muslim women in Western Europe, Europe and North America. Her most recent book was titled The Headscarf Debates, Conflicts and National Narratives a book with uh, Anna Korteweg. And I should mention that Gocha got her PhD at University of Toronto. So thank you for joining us, Gocha. So Gocha will now uh, introduce our speakers. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, and um, uh, in this uh, Zoom meeting with you. Uh, I think we have very interesting papers. Um, let me introduce the um, uh, uh, participants, the presenters. Uh, I'll start with uh, Saeed Atshan, who is going to be our first presenter today. Um, Saeed is an assistant professor of peace and conflict studies at Swarthmore College. I had the chance to uh, go and visit him there last year. It's an amazing uh, campus. He will be spending um, the year 20 and 21 in academic year as a visiting assistant professor of anthropology and visiting scholar in Middle Eastern studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He previously served as a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University. And he earned his joint PhD in anthropology and Middle Eastern studies and, um, and a de uh, de uh, and, um, uh, degree from Harvard, sorry, uh, and a master of public policy MPP degree from Harvard Kennedy School. While at Harvard, he spent two years as a graduate student associate at the Weatherhead Center and also received a Samuel Huntington Dissertation Completion Fellowship from Weatherhead. So um, you're native here at the Weatherhead Center. <laughs> well, uh, um, welcome, Saeed. 
Um, Saad has um, two books recently published, um, Queer Palestine and the Empire of Critique by Stanford University Press, co-authored with Katerina Galor. And the Moral Triangle, Germans, Israelis, and Palestinians Duke, from Duke University Press. His forthcoming book, Paradoxes of Humanitarianism, The Social Life of Aid in the Palestinian Territories, will be published by Stanford University Press Anthropology of Policy Series. Great, uh, great books, uh, which some of uh, we will be teaching this year. Um, so Nicole Dürer is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Copenhagen and the director of Copenhagen Center on Political Mobilization and Social Movement Studies. Dürer's research investigates the critical political translation work by queer and feminist movements supporting asylum seekers in Germany, Sweden, and Denmark. Their book, Political Translation, How Social Movement Democracies Survive by Cambridge University Press, studies the critical intellectual and political leadership of migrants, Latinx, and LGBT leaders of color in US social movements, local democracy, and in global justice coalitions in Europe and the US, including case studies in Germany, Italy, France, and the UK. Um, as Michelle already said, uh, Nicole and I have the um, uh, uh, honor to uh, co-chair the Council for European Studies Immigration Network this year, and it's um, a lot of work, fun to work with her together. Thank you for being here today, Nicole. Um, our third presenter will be George Paul Mayu, is John and Ruth Hazel Associate Professor of the Social Sciences in the Department of Anthropology and the Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Hi, George, nice to meet you. It's the first time we are meeting today. His research and teaching focus on sexuality, gender, and kinship, belonging, citizenship, and the state, race and ethnicity, and the political economy of post-colonial Africa. He is author of Ethnoerotic Economies, Sexuality, Money, and Belonging in Kenya uh, by University of Chicago Press, just came out in 2017, for which he received the Ruth Benedict Book Prize and the Nathan Graborn Book Prize of the American Anthropological Association. He is also co-editor of Ethnicity, Commodity, Incorporation, published by Indiana University Press just this year. And Mayo is currently working on a book entitled Queer Objects, Intimacy, Citizenship, and Rescue in Kenya. His work appears in numerous anthropology and African studies journals and edited volumes. Um, and our last speaker for today is Tunai Altai, whom I um, uh, personally know, is a DAD scholar and a PhD candidate at our university, at the Humboldt University of Berlin Institute of Social Sciences. Um, his research and teaching focus on critical migration studies, sexual citizenship, and the impacts of migrant agency in pursuit of freedom of movement in Europe. In his master's thesis, Alta explores the limits of ethnosexual boundaries, racial belonging, and mobility among people of color communities in Berlin. Alta's current research project is centered on the experiences of Eastern European migrants in Berlin, Altai is also involved in community organizing for migrants and POC communities in Berlin and Istanbul. Um, he's been also teaching a course recently uh, at our university, at the Humboldt University of Berlin, on borders and citizenship. Last but not, not least, um, uh, Michelle Lamont, there is um, probably for a sociologist, it's, um, it's a privilege to introduce uh, Michelle Lamont. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Michelle is a professor of sociology and of African and uh, African American studies at the um, Robert Goldman and the Robert Goldman Professor of European Studies at Harvard University. She served as the 108th president of the American Sociological Association in 2006 and 16 and 17, and she chaired the Council for European Studies from 2006 and 2009. She's also the recipient of a 1996 John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, the 2014 Gutenberg Research Award, and the 2017 Erasmus Prize for her contributions to the social sciences in Europe and the rest of the world. She's also the recipient of honorary doctors from five countries, Canada, France, the Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK. A cultural and comparative sociologist, Lamont is the author and co-author of um, dozen books and edited volumes and over 100 articles and chapters on a range of topics including culture and inequality, 
racism and stigma, academia and language, social change in successful societies, and qualitative methods. Her most recent uh, publications include the co-authored book, Getting Respect, Responding to Stigma and Discrimination in the United States, Brazil, and Israel, published by Princeton University Press in 2016. The 2017 ASA presidential address addressing recognition gaps, digitization, and the reduction of inequality, published in the American Sociological Review in 2018, and the 2018 British Journal of Sociology annual lecture, From Having to Being Self-Worth and the Current Crisis of American Society, and the special issue on data loss on inequality as a multidimensional process, co-edited with uh, Paul Pearson in 2019. Lamont is director of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, Harvard University, and she served as a co-director of the Successful Societies Program, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research from 2002 to 2019. And Andrew Carnegie Fellow for 2019 and 21, she spent 2019 and 20 on sabbatical at the Russell Sage Foundation, where she began writing a book on self-worth and inequality in the United States and Europe. So welcome all of you. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion, uh, the, to your presentations first, of course, and afterwards uh, we will have a discussion together which Michelle and I will be managing the uh, Q&A. So uh, the first uh, word, the first presentation um, goes to Saeed. And um, uh, Saeed, um, I, uh, would you mind uh, starting with the title? I know that it's about Sarah uh, Hajazi, uh, the Egyptian activist. Uh, would you mind uh, starting with the title of your uh, presentation today? Yeah. There's one thing I forgot to mention for the audience. Uh, please, during the event, you can type your questions into the Q&A feature on Zoom, and we will connect, collect the questions for the panelists, and they will address it during the question period. And please keep in mind that the session is being recorded, and it may be posted on the website of the Weatherhead Center. Thank you very much. So, uh, shall I begin? Yeah. Yes, please. Fantastic. So, um, the, uh, good morning, friends. Greetings from Berkeley, California. Thank you so much to the organizers of this wonderful panel for inviting me to contribute to today's discussion. I appreciate the time that folks are taking to engage with us, and I'm deeply honored to speak alongside such remarkable scholars whom I respect deeply. A decade ago, Muhammad Bouazizi, a young Tunisian man, engaged in an act of self-immolation that profoundly changed his country, the Middle East, North Africa region, and the world. He lit himself on fire to protest the degradation he experienced at the hands of a police officer who slapped him, confiscated his scale, and knocked over the fruit cart he, he depended on as a lowly vendor for his and his family's livelihood. The economic oppression and political suffocation of life under an authoritarian regime became too much to bear, and so he took his own life away. Images of Bouazizi, the consciousness about his story, went viral across Tunisia, leading to unprecedented protests around the country with the now famous cheer, Al Shaab Yurid, Asqat, and Nidam, or the people demand the fall of the regime. Citizens around the world followed these historic protests with awe and then celebrated the resignation of the Tunisian dictator, his departure from the country, and the marshalling of a democratic transition. This transition has not been easy, but the Tunisian people remain a beacon of hope for countless individuals globally. Their cry for freedom and dignity resonated in contexts across the Middle East, North Africa. Thus, the Arab Spring movements that began in 2010 became a series of dominoes across the region, with Egypt emerging as a subsequent major site for revolutionary uprisings. Like Tunisia, overwhelmingly nonviolent protests were successful in overthrowing a dictator. Yet counter-revolutionary forces have since hijacked the process of democratic transition, leading to a stubborn persistence of autocratic and oppressive governance in Egypt. A child of the Arab Spring, Sara Higazi was politicized in this context, becoming a human rights activist in Egypt, giving voice to fellow youth 
and daring to dream of a better tomorrow for her nation. Like Bouazizi's self-immolation, the death of Sara Hegazi was a political earthquake that rocked the region and diaspora communities. Yet while individuals from all walks of life mourned Bouazizi, Hegazi's suicide has been rendered legible and worthy of compassion almost exclusively among LGBTQ communities. In a way, she became a martyr in the world of queer Arabs. Sara Hegazi identified as a lesbian while attending an outdoor music concert in Cairo featuring the Lebanese band Mashru'a Layla with the openly gay lead singer Hamid Sinno. Hegazi sat on the shoulders of a friend and proudly displayed the rainbow flag, her face beaming. That image of her claiming public space as a queer woman in this manner will always be imprinted in my consciousness. Reflecting on this last summer, Hamid Sinno wrote, quote, fast forward to 2017, I'm now 29 years old and having traded anonymity for rock and roll, I'm standing on stage in Cairo alongside three of the Middle East's finest musicians before an audience of 35,000 people. Together, we formed the band Mashru'a Layla. Throughout the performance, the band and I repeatedly look at each other and laugh because although we have been touring the world for the better part of the previous decade, this particular concert is special. The audience is singing along with every word so loudly that we can't hear our voices play. The air is thick with love and abandon. Then it happens. Two people in different parts of the audience climb upon their friends' shoulders and unfurl rainbow flags. The audience cheers. That part is often left out of the story, the cheering. They are, after all, watching a band with an openly queer front person. For the rest of the night, we all feel safe. We are all seen. We are all loved. Those two people are Sara Hegazi and Ahmed Ala. And for one night, Cairo is theirs. The queers have won the Arab Spring." End quote. Sinno's words are poignant, yet the other reality is that Hegazi ultimately suffered tremendously for her courageous act. Egyptian security services detained her, leading to torture and sexual assault in prison, and then she self-exiled to Canada upon her release from detention. This past June, the weight of her trauma became too much to bear, and at the age of 30, she took her life in Toronto, leaving behind a brief handwritten note in Arabic that read, to my siblings, I tried to survive and I failed, forgive me. To my friends, the ordeal was too painful and I wasn't strong enough to fight, forgive me. To the world, you were extremely cruel, but I forgive you. Images of this note and news about Hegazi's death went viral across Egypt, the region, and among Arab queer diaspora communities. A widespread phenomenon on social media was of many Arab citizens shaming anyone who dared to commemorate Hegazi, arguing that a queer person and an atheist was not worthy of mourning. The, the deeply entrenched nature of homophobia meant that even in her death, Hegazi could not rest in peace. Closeted queer Arabs have privately described how painful it was for them to not be able to publicly grieve Hegazi, given that her story hits close to home for so many. At the same time, the outpouring of love and commemoration was widespread among LGBTQ Arabs globally, and this has strengthened networks and deepened queer solidarity transnationally. Vigils were held for Hegazi around the world, including in Toronto and New York, and young people and others have taken to social media, organizing events such as virtual vigils on Instagram. Queer Arabs in Egypt, the region, and in diaspora communities had to process this alongside living through a global pandemic. Although research is needed to explore this further, it is clear that the COVID-19 crisis is providing authoritarian regimes cover to further consolidate their power, to ramp up surveillance and repression, and to suppress populations and dissent. Furthermore, LGBTQ populations worldwide find themselves being scapegoated for the pandemic. The struggle against all forms of stigmatization towards LGBTQ people must persist, 
and the struggle for social, political, and economic rights for all must also continue, even in the face of the pandemic. The case of Sara Hegazi has demonstrated how queer liberation is inextricably linked to the fight for human dignity more generally. It has also demonstrated the power of transnational queer solidarity. Within the Middle East, North Africa region, the effects of the Arab Spring continue to reverberate and history is still unfolding. It is important for us to resist Orientalist narratives furthered by academics, journalists, and others whose instinct is to declare the end of hope across an entire region of the world. For instance, just last month, Foreign Policy published an article literally entitled The End of Hope in the Middle East with a subtitle, quote, the region has always had problems, but it's now almost past the point of recovery, end quote. Queer imaginaries and queer solidarities have long taught humanity the necessity of hope for social change. The work of queer theorist Jose Munoz has insisted on the utopian nature of queerness. This past September, in my network of fellow anthropologists, academics and activists mourn the death of a prominent anthropologist, David Graeber. In reflecting on Graeber's legacy, one individual wrote, quote, I confess that I felt my innate pessimism rising again. He chided me by saying that he didn't really understand why so many leftists seem to think of themselves as pessimists. After all, we all do incredibly insanely optimistic things all the time, campaigning, arguing, protesting, even voting, trying to intervene wherever, however we can. We just seem to have forgotten the optimism that's underneath them." End quote. Most Tunisians would agree that Muhammad Bouazizi's death was not in vain. And although the wounds are still fresh and it is too early to tell, many queer Arabs would agree that Sara Hegazi's death was not in vain either. Yet the harshness with which Hegazi was treated by her state and society reveals yet another indicator of the travesty faced by Egypt's LGBTQ population, with Human Rights Watch issuing a report earlier this month on the systematic arrest and torture of gays and lesbians in Egypt. The travesty is compounded when remembering that it was not that long ago that Cairo was the queer capital of the Arab world. Cairo has since been replaced by Beirut as the Arab queer capital. Beirut is home to Helen or Dream, the first LGBTQ organization in the Arab world. Activists challenging the French colonial law criminalizing homosexuality in Lebanon have received sympathetic rulings from judges in Lebanese courts. Lebanese medical, psychiatric, and psychological organizations have been the first in the region to declare that homosexuality is not a mental or physical illness. Furthermore, Beirut has also become home to the Arab Foundation for Freedoms and Equality, the largest LGBTQ organization in the region that has worked across the Middle East and North Africa. I recently concluded my term as head of AFE's board. Over the years, I have seen queer Arab refugees and tourists flock to Beirut for spaces of empowerment, and Beirut facilitate region-wide networks connecting queer Arab social movements, activism, and solidarity. Yet Beirut's ability to catalyze LGBTQ social change locally and regionally into the future is now threatened by a tragic confluence of the pandemic, an economic crisis, political corruption, and stifled protest movements in Lebanon. Lebanon and the region more widely need support, accountability mechanisms, and solidarity from the international community. The world cannot turn its back on the people of the region, both queer and straight. My involvement in LGBTQ Arab civil society, as well as within the queer Palestinian movement, and my research scholarship and teaching has revealed the tremendous work that is needed to draw upon the resources of academia in support of social change. In my book, Queer Palestine and the Empire of Critique, published last May with Stanford University Press, I trace the rise of the LGBTQ social movement in Palestine and how it has become a transnational queer movement in solidarity with Palestinian human rights. I also problematize the significant neglect of queer theory and queer studies within Middle East studies. And I argue that academic and activist critique of imperialism has led to what I call an empire of critique. My book, Grounded in Ethnography, 
illustrates what is at stake when forces on the left privilege the struggle against Western imperialism over struggles against internal systems of oppression, such as homophobia. I reference the words of the Black American lesbian poet and activist, Audre Lorde, who wrote that, quote, there is no hierarchy of oppressions, end quote. Thus, decolonization and queer liberation are intimately connected, and they cannot be divorced or disaggregated. The colonial homophobia of Britain and France in Middle Eastern and North African states like Tunisia and Lebanon, and US military aid to states like Egypt and Israel that is then used to oppress LGBTQ communities makes it clear that queerness must be foregrounded in our historical and political analysis of the region. And the solidarity forged by queer activists from the region also highlight the internal mechanisms of repression that must be named and resisted even when not directly related to Western imperialism. As a junior scholar in Middle East studies, I've had to confront the pervasive skepticism of my field and the persistent question of why I theorize and address homophobia. I'm often told explicitly or implicitly that analysis of queerness is not a priority for the field or the region. Such skeptics see the realities of colonialism, imperialism, military occupations, capitalism, neoliberalism, and pandemics as more urgent and more legitimate domains of inquiry and social mobilization. Yet I insist that dignity for LGBTQ people in the region cannot be forced to wait. Queer Arab voices and struggles deserve to be heard now, and their power resonates precisely because they are anchored in so many intersecting struggles. The global pandemic cannot be used to stifle progress on LGBTQ human rights. I also confront the question of why I would air the dirty laundry of homophobia and the concern that this contributes to the dehumanization and therefore domination of people in the region. My work demonstrates that it is possible to address homophobia genuinely and with nuance while simultaneously doing so in a manner that affirms the humanity and rights of all of society. Many queer people see themselves as intimate and invaluable parts of their social fabrics, and it is love for family and nation that make familial and societal homophobia so deeply painful to endure. Finally, I discuss our dirty laundry because it is a feature of our humanity. After all, all humans have it. Rather than elide homophobia, leaving it to reactionary forces to shape the narratives surrounding it, we have opportunities to shape these narratives with proper historicization and contextualization. The life and death of Sara Hegazi and the queer solidarity it has so beautifully and palpably galvanized remind us that we can no longer remain silent. As Audre Lorde once wrote, and when we speak, we are afraid, our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saeed, uh, for this amazing paper. Um, uh, we will do, um, uh, we will uh, give this, um, our, um, our uh, reflections on it after all the panels are, um, uh, after all the panelists give their papers. Um, I would then, uh, pass it now on to um, uh, Nicole Durr from University of Copenhagen and her paper's title is Migrants Acts of Political Translation and Queer Solidarities in Denmark and Sweden. So the floor is yours, uh, Nicole. Thank you very much, Gotcha. Thank you very much. I hope that you can see the screen share. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, organizers, for having me. And thank you, Syed, for this great presentation. Um, my paper is on queer solidarities in post-migrant societies. And it's a paper in between two books. My previous work looked at um, the role of um, uh, global justice activists in Europe and in the United States. Um, and I found that queer activists actually most of them identifying as people of color were among the leaders um, in the, of the American social movements that I studied. So in this new paper, I'm looking at queer 
migrant and people of color leaders in European social movements. And I'm going to specifically focus on refugee solidarity movements when I talk about solidarity movements or social movements. So here's a picture on the left side um, from Copenhagen where I live. Um, so I want to argue that um, social movements in Europe today are multilingual movements and LGBT coalitions since 2015, the long, long summer, summer of migration, have become more multilingual and socially diverse. Also in Denmark, that did not accept a lot of um, refugees and also only accepts uh, less than 90% of LGBT asylum seekers. Um, so a very restrictive context, um, but also Sweden and Germany as two of my other cases. So what I'm really, um, upset about is that in social movement studies, which is my research field, there is a gap on acknowledging the leading position of minority activists as part of broad majority movements. Um, and I think it's, this position has become even more important. And we see it both in the scholarly work that they're not being talked about um, so much, at least not as organizers of majority uh, co uh, coalitions of left movements, but also in the movements themselves. So I want to point to a critical third posi positionality of queer um, migrants and people of color um, in the movements who are both marginalized, but also they are a critical subjectivity that can actually make the whole movement grow, but also become more aware of its own diversity and its biases. So that's the argument I'm making. So as I mentioned in my previous work, um, I looked at um, the global justice movement, the World Social Forum. I don't know if some of you still remember that constant, the name, or the US Social Forum. This is around 2010. Um, and, and I found that the organizers of the US Social Forum that was internationally seen as being more class-based diverse uh, than any of the European movements um, that happened at the time, global justice movements, or in Latin America, that movement was led by queer women of color. And um, some of them were, many of them were bi bilingual and, and their parents were migrants. And so they also trained young queer and black activists. That was one of their main goals when I interviewed the activists at the time. And so it's not a surprise from that inside perspective that um, the, of, it's a coincidence that the current Black Lives Matter leaders are also um, women of colors and queers. And so let's look at behind the scene of how queer leaders organize solidarity. So here's a quote from um, my research on the US Social Forum, 2010, um, with one of its organizers. Um, here I use the name Carla. So Carla identified as, um, as a Latina and woman of color. Um, and um, she said that organizing and democracy in American social movements today is, according to her and her, her co-organizers, a practice of translation. And here in the quote, I quote, she argues, it's not just about linguistic translation, it's a translation of space, of gender, of bringing in queer folks, people of color. It means changing that face of who the left is. For queers, it was really such a good experience. It changed so much end of quote. So what I noticed is that the American activists and, and the, the leaders uh, like Carla, who organized two US social forums, they were thinking about meetings and about public space as a space of appearance, if you, if you want to go with Butler. Um, they thought that um, democracy as consensus based, as radical, is always going to privilege uh, white majority speakers um, and, and academics. Um, and so their intention was to disrupt culture and to change entirely how public space works. And I compared in, in, my, in my book, um, the US Social Forum with the German Social Forum. And I found that while the US Social Forum struggled with conflicts of race and, and, um, and structural inequalities, and it had zero institutional support um, it actually survived its internal crises, while the German social forum that also had conflicts about um, ethnic diversity and inequality collapsed 
The difference was that in the US, political translators disrupted meetings, they intervened, they performed critical interventions to create an awareness of intersectional diversity. And in the German social forum, there was no such translating practices. So that there was a big impact. Um, so translators in the United States, um, activists, translators are not identity leaders of the old style. They really try to change power, racialized and gendered power structures. Um, and the way meetings are run, the, the way the US uh, left radical left looked. So that's nothing new. Um, if you look at translation theories um, by Chicana and queer feminist writers or decolonial scholars, um, there is a lot of work that shows that activist translation increases the, the visibility of marginalized groups. It transforms how the public space looks. Um, and so all translation is cultural and thus political. So what do I mean? By, by talking about political translation. So I noticed that um, um, there is an empirical practice, so not a theory that comes from movement leaders that have themselves, that combine um, multiple diversities. And in, in the cases I studied, they were all queer or transgender and um, identified as non-white. Um, they were their bilingualism and their kind of switching codes between working class communities and um, funders and middle upper class white uh, color communities skilled them in a way of translating culture where they would bo both bridge divisions but also use their positionality to disrupt. So political translation as I see it or, or saw it happen is an empirical practice that is disruptive and dialogical. So this is radical democracy and liberal democracy at the same time and it can bridge differences in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, and language. And I also argue that it addresses cultural bias in meetings, in spaces where people interact, which is condensed in positional misunderstandings, where people walk away from each other because race came up as a word, as a conflict. Um, so um, I want to now ask critically, so how does that connect to European social movements? Um, how does that work in activist groups, refugee solidarity groups in Europe that are um, not only multilingual, but are also divided through extreme inequalities between the citizens who are LGBT activists, who want to support LGBT refugees and the refugees. Um, so what's the context right now for LGBT solidarity organizing? Here's a quote from um, a voluntary translator in an LGBT refugee uh, group. Um, who talks about the, uh, the experiences of translating both in institutional settings, in asylum interviews, but also within movements and of the experience of translating. And so my first relevant finding that I want to discuss with you is that the people who can do this critical work of political translation, where they disrupt meetings, they interrupt culture, um, interrupt dominant style, as well as dialogue with leaders, these people are always resident migrants. They are not refugees. Whenever the refugees try to do this work or the asylum seekers, they are not being taken seriously. So even though they have the linguistic skills, the members of a mainstream majority led LGBT coalitions will not take the refugees seriously. So the migrants have an interesting intermediary position um, that I want to talk a little bit more about. So about the research design and case selection, just really briefly, I looked at Denmark and Sweden, LGBT refugee solidarity groups who are forming part of broader majority-led um, solidarity coalitions. Um, and I studied them ethnographically using discourse analysis, participant observation and interviews. So here are the findings. Um, one interesting thing is that um, you always need some white middle class citizen activist group who wants to work, to have to work with linguistic interpreters and 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 in in multilingual groups and you have that right now in the lgbt um, um arena because um, migrants and refugees bring new languages so you often have white swedish danish or also german um, solidarity organizers 
who think that um, multilingual um, volunteer translation is a great thing and is entirely new, like you see in this first quote by Christoph, um, who is, um, is on the other side of the ocean from me, um, is based in, in Malmö and founded the first language justice group. But what's really interesting is that the wide majority, the citizen activists, um, assume that translation is about language primarily and nothing else. Yes, there is linguistic differences and they, they have to do with privilege, but that's it. And when I, when I look at the perceived impact by minority activists and the coalitions, there's a very different um, notion of translation. There's the, the idea that um, working multilingually and working with the presence of critical activist translators disrupts dominant culture and movements. On the left side, you see um, a quote by an LGBT refugee activist on the empowering impact from being able to speak her own language, which is Arabic. Um, and, and she made this statement towards a group of Swedish majority activists on the left, whom she criticized for being implicitly uh, uh, racist and being used to their white privilege. So what was really important here is not only that the activists um, like the LGBT solidarity uh, um, uh, refugees felt empowered, but also that they could talk about race. So we have a double impact here by a group of people who do simultaneous interpretation um, and translating. What's also interesting is that the people who did the translation themselves and the minority leaders um, um, were aware of white majority people listening through the fact of meetings being organized in a different way um, than usual. So I want to theorize that with Eleonore Ilio, Lepina, who argues, quoting Sarah Emmett, that um, racialized activists' resistances against dominant culture is often to use interruption, to somehow interrupt the flow of conversation by, in, in Eleonore's case, she looked at white feminists, but here is white uh, solidarity activists. So um, to, to sum this up, um, translators themselves felt marginalized. This is what my interviews show by the mainstream movement leaders. And through this experience of marginalization, sometimes racialization, through being not recognized as full members, they develop a counter hegemonic awareness. So it's migrants who are not citizens, but they're also seen as refugees. They're never acknowledged as a full member. And that experience uh, creates um, um, their awareness. But they're more than refugees in terms of status. They have a permanent status in the countries in, in Sweden and in Denmark. So when they disrupt, the consequences of disruption are not as severe as when a ref refugee um, basically resists a white majority coalition um, uh, member. Um, so, nevertheless, translator strategies of resisting racism is also limited. I found two different ways. The activists who were in this, in this marginalized translating position in, in Sweden uh, took a separatist um, route. They used their own radical democratic organizing style, but then they separated from their white um, majority colleagues. And those in Denmark that I stu studied, they cooperated within uh, white majority-led solidarity groups, but they felt co-opted and they remained individualized. I can say more about that um, um, later, but I just want to sum up that in troubled times, political translators, activists who come from queer minority backgrounds, are uh, creating spaces for new solidarities and dialogue in, in, in social movements. They bring up silenced topics like white privilege and racism that in monolingual movements or um, uh, white middle class facilitated movements cannot happen and also can't happen in minority movements that isolate themselves. Um, how does political translation work? It always works by disrupting dominant culture while remaining in dialogue, dialogue with that um, very culture. So political translators are neither brokers nor are they identity leaders. Um, and so in, in terms of, I don't know how much time I have left, but thinking about you here in, in this room, sociologists of culture, we know a lot about um, how inequality perpetuates in social movements that are egalitarian styled. Katie Blee and Francesca Poleta's work um, 
We also know about cultural bias and class-based bias um, through Paul Lichterman's work and, uh, and Betsy Lando Wright's work. And, um, and we know through Prudence Carter's work that intersectional boundaries can be overcome if you have multicultural straddlers, which in a way is, is another way to think about like what I call political translation, but in the sector of US education. And so this is a study on the leading role of LGBT migrants and people of color who use their critical third positionality, their cultures, switching skills, language skills, class uh, status and gender skills for um, organizing a different type of solidarity that changing the space of appearance. So this is great for social movement scholars. I can tell more about that, but also from a queer um, feminist perspective, of, of my writing. So they're, they're kind of helping movements to, to perform uh, acts of citizenship, performative acts of citizenship. They change the way public space um, in movement works. And so to speak with Hannah Arendt, um, they're organizing the power with like a collective power. And here um, the political translation work is not just a technique, it's not and power changes um, that make um, coalitions work more inclusively. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nicole, um, for this uh, great presentation. Um, uh, I made a lot of notes. I'm looking forward to discussing with you later. Um, uh, I'm going to because we're running a little bit. We are a little bit over time, uh, so I am going to switch to um, Mew, um, uh, Mew, uh, George Paul Mew's paper uh, presentation. Count, the title of the presentation is "Countering Contagious Contagions: COVID-19, Plastics, and the Politics of Gayism in East Africa." The floor is yours, um, oh, uh, Paul. Uh, thank you, Gorgia. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the limited time I have, I wish to reflect uh, briefly on a very particular set of modalities of queer activism and solidarity uh, through art in Kenya, um, where I have been doing fieldwork on questions of sexuality, belonging, and citizenship since 2005. I also wish to reflect briefly on how these forms of solidarity can be further pursued through ethnography, uh, something that for me as an anthropologist uh, is a key uh, mode of, of, of collaboration and political participation. Now, to do this, I need to uh, propose first an ethnographic detour uh, and outline some of the particular logics and grammars through which anti-homosexual rhetoric and governance play out in some of the contexts where I have been working. In particular, the notion of gayism um, and its association in the um, Anglophone kind of um, African uh, context, but not only with um, uh, questions of affliction and contagion, uh, uh, contagions pertaining to both the body and uh, the polity. And I need to do this because in order to understand emerging forms of resistance and, and understand or try to imagine how ethnography itself could become such a form uh, of resistance, it is crucial to understand first um, how some of the logics of homophobia on the ground in particular contexts take on aspirations, sentiments, um, uh, desires, political utopias that emerge in different kinds of domains of social life, not necessarily in domains uh, primarily associated with, say, gender and sexuality. I'm inspired here by critical work um, on homophobia by queer theorists and anthropologists such as Martin Manalansan, David Murray, and others, who made a very compelling point that I quote uh, Manal Manalansan here, there is no such thing as pure and simple homophobia. That is to say, uh, homophobia is not necessarily a universal self-explanatory category, but that anti-homosexual sentiments, signs, logics, and dyma uh, dynamics also play out in particular ways in particular contexts. Um, that is to say, uh, um, I'm actually currently finishing a book that departs precisely from this point, uh, namely that um, 
if political homophobia is a tactic of power and govern governance um, that has been intensively globalized within the past two and even more so last decade um, uh, as a tactic of rule, the homosexual body, quote unquote, imagined by this discourse, uh, by, def by definition, an object of outrage, violence, and exclusion is not pre-given, um, but rather is constructed uh, in these transnational conversations in relation to national contexts in ways that resonate with um, uh, a particular regional, national sensibilities, political, economic predicaments, and more. And here, a vast set of objects, what I, queer, what, what, what I call in my uh, current book uh, manuscript, queer objects um, and imaginaries, come to be entangled in the production of the homosexual, but also lead us, if we pursue these objects ethnographically, pursue, um, lead us into different kinds of social domains, um, uh, domains of social life, where the sentiments that then come to be associated with or directed against the homosexual body uh, emerge in relation to anxieties over respectability, work, social reproduction, and much more. And it is some of these particular imaginaries that some of queer artivism or activism through art uh, uh, seeks to um, interrogate. When I was invited to, uh, to speak uh, on this panel, uh, I first wondered if COVID-19 has really produced such a radically new context for politics and um, solidarity, uh, or if it merely intensified, reinvented, and reorganized forms of rhetoric, governance, and resistance that have been already at play, sometimes less visibly, in different places. A more interesting question for me, um, doing research in East Africa, um, was, um, how the coronavirus entered a certain extant political imaginary of quote unquote gayism as a contagion. Let me explain. In August uh, this year, President uh, Evariste Mdaishimie uh, of Burundi claimed, and I quote, homosexuality is the origin of curses such as AIDS and the coronavirus, and that, I quote again, homosexuals are responsible for cases of coronavirus in Burundi, end of quote. Now he echoed political and religious leaders in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, who in an effort to legitimize the state as a source of moral protectionism, have similarly depicted uh, COVID-19 as either divine punishment for um, a globalization's quote unquote, pollutions of local culture and nature, or itself a form of contagion, not unlike um, uh, what is understood uh, by uh, uh, gayism. Such statements fueled police arrests, harassment, and extortions uh, targeting primarily LGBTQ migrants um, and uh, queer asylum seekers, um, uh, both in, in Uganda and in Kenya. Uh, consider one example. Uh, because of the infamous um, so-called kill, kill the gays bill uh, of Uganda and the, the prosecution, uh, persecution of um, a queer uh, folks in Kampala, there is a, a, a huge wave of queer uh, asylum seekers um, in Kenya. At, at, the, at the present, I think around 750 uh, people, but also from Tanzania, where President Magufuli has of late uh, um, uh, adopted a similar kind of political homophobia tactic of power. Um, so Kenya somehow uh, became uh, this place of a temporary refuge um, uh, before UN, um, uh, in, co in collaboration with uh, various embassies, uh, tries to uh, relocate uh, queer um, asylum seekers um, in other parts of the world. Now, um, because Nairobi itself uh, is not necessarily safe uh, for uh, many uh, queer asylum seekers, um, many of them are put in so-called safe houses um, where they live in up to 30 or 40 people in one house uh, for the duration of the time um, until, uh, until they're being um, 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 uh, connected to uh, migrating um, in, to other countries. Um, now, already before the, the, the advent of the pandemic, asylum seekers have uh, spoken of how um, uh, 
um, they felt completely stuck, unable to work, uh, meanwhile uh, being constantly targeted by police um, uh, for extortion or uh, being locked up um, and so on. What happened is that this has intensified since the pandemic uh, began, but um, in addition to that, something else quite interesting um, um, and uh, tragic uh, also took place, namely the targeting by police of these safe houses under, uh, not under um, the kind of penal code anti-sodomy law, um, but rather uh, using um, uh, social distancing measures uh, and bans uh, to target some of these houses for um, not respecting uh, the limit of uh, socializing of up to 10 people. Um, but interestingly, while from a legal point of view, they used these bans on socializing um, to target the safe houses, uh, for a wider national public um, and, and newspapers and so on, they played with a metaphor of contagions, how coronavirus, the coronavirus and gayism are indeed similar um, uh, contagions. Let me say a, a bit more about the nation of gayism, which then becomes also very important to how um, uh, solidarity and, and uh, queer resistance and activism uh, is framed in a particular kind of artistic um, uh, uh, genre. The notion of gayism as a contagion, uh, so not something that is an immutable, uh, which is, is part of this homophobic imaginary, which is not um, something like homosexuality as an immutable uh, uh, sexual and social type, something that is within us um, uh, and that produces kind of particular kinds of uh, people. Uh, gayism plays much more strongly with the idea of a trend that proliferates. And this idea has originated in, in my reading uh, uh, of it in the religious rights uh, notions of gay recruitment in the US, I think already in the 60s and 70s, um, evangelical logics as of children at risk of homosexuality because allegedly homosexuals cannot reproduce, therefore they need to uh, uh, recruit. But in recent decades, it also co-opted imaginaries of different kind of pandemics and uh, also including environmental issues. Now, as part of my book, on queer objects. Um, I'm interested in the set of, of, of things, artifacts that have come to play a central role in defining um, what the sexualized target of exclusion, violence, and outrage is here. What is the imagined homosexual of homophobic um, uh, uh, discourse? And one of the objects that I picked up that, uh, and I've been preoccupied with over the last few years is, uh, or rather a category of objects, is that of plastics. And I came across um, uh, this category by first encountering in national newspaper and in the social media statements uh, such as the following. Um, homosexuality or gayism is um, like a plastic foreign import from the West that has nothing to do with the chemistry, quote unquote, uh, of African uh, bodies. Now, this kind of statement um, uh, caught my attention because already in my ethnographic work, I had been gathering little uh, timbits about plastic and how it figures in both rural uh, imaginaries of social life, but also in relation to ethnicity. Growing anxieties over plastics as a so-called um, foreign pollutant found expression in seemingly un unrelated things. Uh, in 2017, there was a major ban on plastic bags in Kenya um, that attracted a lot of attention. At the same time, the, um, um, all kinds of debates started emerging in the national press um, around plastic rice. Um, so you have this plastic rice granule that would melt in water when boiled um, that were allegedly uh, being um, brought to Kenya from um, from China, um, uh, but somehow packaged uh, to look uh, local. Um, but also debates then about homosexuality as a foreign pollutant and different kinds of social categories of masculinity in Northern Kenya where I worked, I worked with a social category of young men who call themselves and are called by others uh, plastic boys and who are refugees, uh, Somali refugees in the area. And the belief here is that um, um, uh, like objects of plastic, uh, they have no ability to grow and socially reproduce, uh, hence um, their um, uh, kind of uh, comparison uh, with um, the materiality of plastics. 
I came across um, all kinds of other things. In rural kinship, plastics, for example, are objects and artifacts that don't attach themselves to the body and families, things that remain foreign and therefore can threaten uh, the bodies of um, uh, people in all kinds of ways. In the villages where I work in the north, again, uh, for example, there, is, um, there are diseases such as uh, plastic in the womb, which is described as a form of uh, infertility uh, or plastic teeth, um, of, of something common in, in, in uh, southern Kenya with uh, symptoms quite similar to AIDS. But also the rise since the 1990s of a set of prophets, mostly young girls who visit God and come back with messages uh, saying that uh, women should clean their households, completely eradicate plastic um, if they, they care for their own health and the health of their um, uh, livestock. Now, this um, kind of broader understanding of plastic as an object of contagion around which both notions of an autochthonous uh, um, ethnic or regional area is being produced, but also the utopia of, a, of an autochthonous nation unthreatened uh, by the foreign, has, has something important to tell us about how the homosexual again in the homo, uh, in this in particular kind of imaginaries come to be associated with a contagion. Now I suggest that the coupling um, just in the last few months of COVID-19 with homosexuality invoked and magnified an older ideology of contagion that over the past two decades has associated gayism with uh, bodily and environmental pollution through plastic and thus mobilized a set of anxieties um, um, and aspirations from vast domains of social life, anxieties over ethnicity, anxieties over the environment, anxieties over the future of the national citizen, and um, displaced them onto um, uh, um, concentrated them onto uh, this imagined homosexual body. And um, finishing this kind of long detour, uh, I want to get back to the question of queer art, because it is in this context, especially in the context of the pandemic, where other forms of mobility are suddenly restricted, that what is circulating extensively are these messages um, on uh, social media and the sharing of particular kind of queer art emerging in circles like in Kampala and, and Nairobi and so on, um, at, whether as memes or in other forms. And and some of this art takes um, the question, takes and plays with the question both of a pandemic, but also the question of um, contagion uh, more broadly uh, construed. Queer art involving plastics and proliferation that, that proliferates on social media in response to queer mobility um, offers an important entry point in how solidarity can emerge by redeploying and resignifying media of anti homosexual ideology and governance. And um, I won't share any art with you here just because I couldn't, uh, on short notice, uh, secure permission from, from the artists, but you could certainly Google them and, and find them all over um, the internet. Um, artists like like Neo Musangi, who um, um, reimagines the idea of um, a hetero um, uh, normativity and a hetero patriarchy by playing with um, the uh, image of the plastic dildo. Um, Zanele Muholi, whom we hosted at the Cooper Gallery here at Harvard just last semester before the lockdown, who also plays with plastic uh, and transforms plastic hoses and all kinds of plastic beads into traditional African jewelry thus somehow questioning the, 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 the foreignness of plastic as such. Uh, Romoland Hazume, who uh, transforms buckets and jerrycans into African masks by wrapping um, uh, various kinds of kanga cloth around them, um, and so on. But also in my own ethnographic work, I drew theoretical inspiration um, for what I call queer objects. Objects like plastic that though they are central to the production of homophobic imaginaries, are also key to its critical undoing. Uh, I drew this uh, uh, in theoretical imagination from uh, the artistic work of um, a Kenyan um, um, uh, Kawira Murishia and her uh, by now infamous kind of kanga project, where she takes these kanga fabrics, kangas are um, 
uh, fabrics that women wrap, uh, traditionally wrap around their, uh, themselves and that carry uh, beyond the kind of a rich uh, symbolics, also various kinds of proverbs in Swahili. And one could think actually of uh, kangas of having historically been very complicit in the production of a certain kind of heteropatriarchy because their messages are often about um, a certain kind of heterosexism, a certain kind of celebration of marriage and heterosexual love. And Mirishia takes these kangas and re-signifies them, makes them into queer objects that promote queer solidarity and um, um, and somehow celebrate uh, the pleasures of uh, queer love. And what I found fascinating about this, uh, just before I, I, I conclude, is that one doesn't seek, um, uh, in this kind of forms of, of queer solidarity, doesn't seek a certain radical outside of an object that it can otherwise be oppressive, plastic, the kanga, but rather seeks to activate um, and Sayed brought up um, um, uh, Jose Esteban Munoz, so this is what I'm thinking of here as well, activate a queer potentiality in an object that is otherwise oppressive and therewith resignify that object. Furthermore, resignifying the object and circulating that object through social media and other contexts, one produces publics, publics of queer solidarity that are not necessarily national or regional, but transnational uh, uh, broadly uh, construed. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, now, um, the next person, next presenter is Tonai Altai uh, from Humboldt University of Berlin. And, um, he changed um, his title a little bit, um, so I would let him um, uh, say the new title. Um, it's not anymore. Oh, okay. In the grip of rising nationalism and the pandemic, examining Turkey's um, emerging digital queer spaces. Ah, here it is. Okay, the floor is yours tonight. Okay, thank you very much, Gerke. Hi everyone, uh, today I'll be exploring Turkey's queer digital publics by focusing on the AKP government's intensifying attacks on LGBTQ visibility domestically and on the transnational digital platforms in Turkey. Now I want to begin my talk with a recent event that will frame the complexity of AKP's way of utilizing political homophobia and its boundary making consequences for Turkey's LGBTQ people. Exactly. On July 2020, Netflix announced the cancellation of a much anticipated Turkish series following pressure from the AKP government. The series, which was due to air next year, featured a gay character named Osman. Although the character only had a supporting role and appeared in strictly non-sexual scenes, the radio and television Supreme Council of Turkey took issue with the series. A few days following its cancellation, Erdogan addressed the nation in a live stream speech and castigated Netflix, Twitter, and YouTube for and I quote, attacking Turkey's national and spiritual values from the shadows again, end quote. Erdogan also made it clear that he aimed to get rid of the nation's immoral and dishonorable people who clearly use these digital platforms to voice opposition and remain, remain beyond the reach of Turkey's strictly censored and regulated print and broadcast media. Erdogan's vehement opposition to global digital platforms and its immoral and dishonorable users in Turkey has had boundary-making consequences. Now, expanding on the singular case of Netflix cancer show, The Rejection of Osman, we can see that a fictional Turkish character uh, can actually create symbolic boundaries, which exacerbates the marginalization of LGBTQ people in Turkey. AKP spokesperson Mahi Lunal later conveyed the AKP's condemnation of Netflix uh, not as a threat directed to LGBTQ people, but rather to what they consider as political and pornographic forms of gayness that offend Turkey's public decency, a notion that is clearly defined according to the respectability politics of the government. This boundary, as previously described by Evren Saj and Jenkins by studies, draws on an older distinction between the respectable pious majority versus the marginal deviance within Turkey. Hence, uh, Mahir Nal's AKP spokesperson's comments and AKP's Netflix feud illustrates an inclusion paradox, which basically equates being openly gay with being political and being political as a condition for exclusion. Clearly, this, this discourse only leaves room for LGBTQ people to exist in the shadows like Osman 
known but unseen by Turkey's publics. The second point I want to raise is how the AKP framed Osman's presence on Turkish Netflix as a foreign threat to Turkey. Netflix is a transnational digital platform with both global and local operations, working mostly with local producers, scriptwriters, and casting for productions that are made in Turkey. Despite this duality, the framing of Osman as foreign and unfitting to Turkey's values conflates openly LGBTQ people with the West and rendering them not only immoral, but also outsiders in Turkey. Following this logic, being Turkish and openly gay appear as two mutually exclusive conditions and denies the uh, conditions. And the logic denies the rootedness and locality of LGBTQ identities in Turkey. This narrative also serves to another purpose that I wanna highlight here. Osman becomes the proof of the West moral malintent toward Turkey and its, according to AKP, respectable and pious majority. As this feud shows, we see that AKP government is appealing to all binaries of local, global, national, foreign, and moral immoral to fuel homophobia in Turkey and to instrumentalize it as part of his attempt to induce Western Europe skepticism in Turkey. Now I want to uh, return to a uh, COVID-19 issue. So in the face of the rising exclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic has posed unprecedented challenges uh, for Turkey's LGBTQ communities. Of course, approaching the pandemic as an isolated and exceptional moment of time fails to grasp the continuities of violence, discrimination, and marginalization that are already the part of LGBTQ people and other marginalized, marginalized groups in Turkey. These communities are particularly vulnerable due to limited access to health services, as well as everyday experience of stigmatization, discrimination, hate speech, and other discriminatory experiences. In the case of elderly and working class LGBTQ people, the pandemic has a devastating impact on unemployment and other financial insecurities. All this and more has marked 2020 as a dark moment for LGBTQ communities over the world, one that has surely worsened existing oppressive systems and posed new challenges. Despite, or even maybe because of these dark times, Turkey held a digital Pride Month in June. This year's theme was titled, Where Am I? A note to pre-existing restrictions in Turkey over LGBTQ public gather gatherings and the challenges posed by the pandemic. So this is the moment that my ethnographic studies starts. Uh, I partook in the Digital Pride and other online LGBTQ events, which started as early as March. And I noticed a glaring contrast between the AKP government's ongoing attacks and the growing digital visibility of Turkey's queer communities. I want to explore this more in the time we have left today. So I first uh, attended parties organized by Club COVID and Queer Waves, two LGBTQ art and performance collectives based in Turkey. At first, uh, I was surprised by the sheer number of DJ and performance events as opposed to any other formats. But later I realized that the dancing and performances were usually accompanied most nights with intimate conversations and even encouraged some participants to show up next day in drag or attend the parties with the family with whom they shared a living space. Especially during the shutdowns in April and May, uh, Zoom provided an urgently needed digital space for drag queens, gender saboteurs, queer performers, DJs, and kinky queers from different parts of Turkey and its global diaspora to come together. From the beginning of the shutdown in March to the course of Pride Month, I became acquainted with some of the digital party goers and invited them for interviews. I conducted 15 in-depth interviews over a period of six months from April to September with LGBTQ people who were deeply affected financially by the pandemic. To explain the impacts of the symbolic and material boundaries um, over the lives of my partners, Baunu, a 34-year-old trans activist and DJ commented that, and I quote, as a queer person, I always knew that my existence was not approved by the Turkish government but we've never been targeted systematically like this before. Nothing like what we've been through this year." End quote. Several others I interviewed also voiced concerns about feeling cornered in Turkey, a feeling that has only been exasperated by the new restrictions and the loss of income that many of my participants have suffered. So in the face of these challenges, digital publics pose both possibilities and limitations for Turkey's LGBTQ people. During the first set of interviews I conducted in April and May, 
Participants were imbued with feeling of belonging and connectedness and described the digital queer parties as a way of finding hope and elevating the stress and panic of the pandemic. For many queer performers, digital queer spaces provided the conditions to perform, show up and clean their presence both virtually and materially as they find ways to circumvent the restrictions posed by the government. The concept of safety appeared repeatedly in my interview. The participants, who were mostly tech savvy people, knew when and to whom to be visible by implementing door policies for their digital events and utilizing other digital options, such as filters, to control how much they wanted to show. On the other hand, the digital platforms posed new normative standards, which often appear in forms of inappropriate content and acceptable use, banning the display of nudity and thus limiting queer performance and intimacy online. Of course, uh, because the future remains uncertain, it is too soon to draw a conclusion that would either prove or contest the agency and resilience of Turkish queers in the face of the AKP's oppression and the restrictions over their visibility and belonging. Arguing, arguing in favor of resilience, uh, Kika, a drag artist known for nudity in their performance, reminded me of a saying popular in the Turkish drag scene. It goes as this, Abla Yashedin, which translates literally to sis, you are living. A saying that underscores queer performance's attachment to concept of fantasy and reality in a way that transforms the meaning of both. Regardless of the restrictions, queer performers uh, has always worked with and within the limits of queer fantasy and normative realities, bending the rules of social engagement as defined by heteronormative ideals defined both nationally and globally. Clearly, the fluidity and openness of digital queer spaces has created the conditions and tools for participants to strategically navigate their visibility and to both circumvent and contest some of the governmental and global restrictions. At the same time, I argue that this resilience is more complex. Addressing this issue, Sevim, a 50-year-old trans woman activist and DJ, confided in me the following, and I quote, all queers in our region have suffered so much Adapting to injustice and hardship has become part of our survival. Adapting sometimes come too easy, it frightens me." End quote. Seeing Sevim's troubled face as she uttered these words made me realize that adaptability is not a desired state and definitely not an indicator of a happy coexistence. Instead, adaptability within the context of authoritarian regimes may be a matter of survival, one that requires LGBTQ people to endlessly, albeit strategically, negotiate their visibility in Turkey. Another of my participants, Elif, a 35-year-old lesbian feminist activist and community organizers, alluded this uh, with a paradigm of adaptability and exhaustion with a play on an old Turkish song. If we ever stop dancing, we shall all turn to stone. The song goes like this. End of quote. The constant cycle of adapting to injustice and discrimination that many LGBTQ people in Turkey go through manifests itself in these lyrics almost like a curse. If they ever stop, they shall turn to stone. Yet Sevim, Elif, Kika, Banu, and others that I have interviewed in the past months have found ways to keep going. So in conclusion, Cancelling Osman, open the gay fictional character on Netflix, was uh, the AKP's response to perceived foreign threats to Turkey's pious heteronormative national identity. But as I have discerned from my own experience, recent interviews and the limited scholarly work, Turkey's digital space have already been claimed by queers. Queers whose presence refused the local global national foreign binaries put forward as part of the AKP government's attempts to define who constitutes the respectable majority in Turkey. Furthermore, my data shows that digital engagements among my participants may even have strengthened the rootedness of queer social movements in Turkey and given form to a new regional queer consciousness between LGBTQ people in different parts of Turkey and its diaspora. As one of my participants noted, and I quote, digital, the, with digital events, we got to see that Deliler, which means crazy people, are not only in Istanbul, but we are actually everywhere in Turkey, end quote. These expanding local to local networks are particularly important considering the center periphery dynamic, which has contributed to the lack of visibility of LGBTQ people outside of Istanbul. In Turkey's case, the pandemic has provided the pretext for the government to intensify its attacks on digital and material possibilities for LGBTQ visibility 
and to induce West and Euroscepticism while spreading homophobia in Turkey. The Netflix controversy I began with emblematizes how the act of claiming visibility and belonging as an openly LGBTQ person in Turkey is treated as immoral and foreign, or as part of a hidden political plot to attack Turkey's respectable and pious majority. While the AKP government leaves no space for local queer agency, the LGBTQ collectives I interviewed demonstrated that they possess a growing regional and translocal awareness as they continue querying Turkey's digital spaces and transcend the normative boundaries imposed by local and global actors. Thank you. Thank you so much tonight. This is um, uh, for a hopeful also note about the situation in Turkey uh, at the end. Um, and uh, talking about the survival strategies of um, queer people who are uh, living under extreme difficult conditions. Um, would it be possible for um, the discussants uh, to turn on um, uh, their uh, uh, videos? And um, also I'm looking where Michelle is. Yes, Michelle is also there because we decided before that we are gonna do the Q&A section together. Um, Michelle, would you like to start or how shall we do this? Well, since there's only 15 minutes left and a couple of people have asked questions, I'm with, I wouldn't mind just giving the floor to uh, the audience, uh, but uh, maybe you would like to ask a question. Uh, I am also seeing that Myra and Meg Perret uh, that asked uh, questions on, on one side. I will also put myself on the list then. I'm not going to take the privilege of being the discussion today. I'm very intrigued by the papers I made, pages and pages of notes. This is so interesting. Uh, there's one thing um, that I would like to probe in, but I will wait for my turn. Um, I would suggest that we'll start with Myra's first question. Okay. Myra, do you want to uh, ask it yourself? Or maybe it's a case where we have to read it for them. Okay, I do answer live. Now, Myra, I think you could, uh, can you try to talk? Do you hear yourself? Maybe she cannot talk. Okay, uh, I will uh, read. She actually, Myra has two questions. So I'll read both, uh, one for Nicole and one for Jason. And then the two of them can simply answer. So Myra Ferry uh, says, Nicole, I love your talk and the work on political translation you've been doing. Can you also say something about how such translation operates in strongly monolingual cultures like much of the US? Is the actual resistance to multi multilingualism a form of social movement publication in the Trump orbit? Great question. And then uh, about for Jason, Mara says, Jason, outstanding analysis. Do you think the rise of reaction to so-called global culture is also a key factor inside Western nations? Can resistance and reaction be seen as a shadow globalization? So, who wants to start? I can start. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Myra, for asking these smart questions to us. Um, and in this time, um, I loved your question to me. Um, you ask how political translation can work in, in monolingual spaces like the US. And I thought also of a Trump US. Um, and so, or also a, a Germany that is um, struggling at the time when I did my analysis with mass migration. Um, so one interesting thing is, well, yes and no. So in the refugee solidarity movement in Germany, I noticed that there were two types of groups. Um, one, one side of groups, the more mainstream, close to the church or civil society, they had a Habermasian idea of, of dialogue with refugees, have coffee together, it was more middle class. And, and they, um, they refused to translate themselves, their organizations. And one gave me a quote, why should we translate ourselves? They should learn German, like towards the refugees. Um, and another type of groups, and these were the intersexual organizers, the feminists and the queers, the LGBTs who translated everything. And um, the organizational setting, they were aware of class differences to welcome, uh, let's say LGBT refugees from Afghanistan. And then the United, now take it home to the United States in the US social forum. The organizers were bilingual children of migrants 
um, there were also um, people of color and they transposed the idea of linguistic translation and how it can solve, the translator can disrupt to think about race-based misunderstandings, but not race-based, but positional misunderstandings about race, about, um, about class culture. And they used, um, and they created meetings in a different way. They created small group settings where those who felt insecure were in the majority. So these were women, indigenous activists, people of color, working class. Um, and they created a national leadership board where these groups were in the majority. So they consciously changed culture, which is what, for example, Bourdieu said, you can't do, it's always artificial. They did it. And why did it do it? It came from their professional experience of um, anti-racist organizing at the local community level and at connecting different communities. So what I'm, wh what I'm writing about is just what is already happening and I hope it still happens in this time. Thank you, Myra. These are great questions. So there's another question by, by Meg Parrott for George. Uh, she says, excellent presentation. I'm curious about discourses of the natural and unnatural in representations of plastic gays and viruses you mentioned. Thank you so much, Meg. This is, uh, this is a great question. And I think that the very, the very nature of the natural gets to be reconfigured here, depending on how you approach things. And one of the points that I try to make is that you pick up uh, uh, analytically an object uh, um, like plastic. Uh, you start to break down the, uh, the, the sep liberal separation between an environmental politics and a sexuality politics. And what you see then is the following, um, namely that um, the perception of being at the periphery of capitalism, where um, um, not only cheap plastic commodities are being unloaded, but also Kenya, among other countries, are also a place where plastic waste for a long time has been exported in this global political economy. Uh, and understanding that in, 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 from a certain perspective as what does it mean then um, to um, uh, import, quote unquote, a certain kind of sexuality. I just want to give a, a quick example. Um, last year, uh, a video started circulating on social media um, of uh, two male lions in the Maasai Mara National Park, Kenya's pride of, of tourism, uh, copulating. And, in, and this was kind of like a, a funny video that, that people started sharing and also saying, well, here it is. You keep claiming that homosexuality is un-African. And Ezekiel Mutua, a major figure of, uh, of Kenyan politics and uh, the head of the uh, censorship board, um, has come out to make a claim that, that also went viral, that the lions caught gayism from two white male tourists who were kissing in the park. Now, of course, this was very funny and everybody was laughing about it and, and whatnot. Um, but there are two things to be taken from that. One, uh, the attempt then in a global queer liberal public to see that as irrational, to reproduce the sexual ideology of racism where, you know, African homophobia um, is the kind of like um, a peak of uh, non-rationality. And second, to presume that there isn't a link between sexuality politics and, and environmental politics, where the defense of a certain kind of um, environmental nature from plastic pollutants can become uh, metaphoric of, but also like really entangled with the defense of a certain kind of reproductive sexuality as cultural from th something or a certain kind of gender order as natural uh, from something that comes with, quote unquote, the perversions of uh, globalization. So for me as an anthropologist, the question is, how is the natural and, and nature made in this context? And how can we dwell on these logics without too quickly reproducing the sexual ideologies of racism? Yeah, great answer. Thank you. Gocha, do you want to go with your questions or your comments? You need to unmute yourself. I still have to get used to uh, uh, my digital life. <laughs> so from Sweden to Germany, to Denmark, Egypt, Kenya, Senegal, we went through a lot of countries. We looked at the different kind of hierarchies uh, within the uh, gay population, uh, immigrants versus refugees. And we looked at the global inequality as a part of political homophobia. 
and something was um, really burning inside me. I said, okay, so this is not only about COVID-19, this is also a far right um, threat uh, to homophobia. So this is not only um, uh, the COVID-19 issue that uh, also tonight was saying, this is also a political um, uh, construction of uh, uh, political homophobia. At this point, uh, when I was listening to Jason's talk, I was thinking, um, where is colonialism in there? And I would like to uh, connect this with uh, also Saed's talk, uh, giving examples from Egypt, and then we are not seeing an international community. When Turkey was uh, negotiating its accession to the European Union, EU was all there for LGBT rights women's violence against women and stuff like that. So where is the international community? Why are these people are left to their devices to, uh, uh, to um, uh, console each other on digital screens? I was wondering whether we can also comment a little bit, uh, all of you, perhaps um, uh, uh, this far right threat in the COVID-19 era, and George George Paul also mentioned about that uh, uh, um, in, in this example in his, in his uh, paper, um, that it's not only about COVID-19, uh, there is a whole political agenda going, going on behind it through plastic, through sexuality, through environmental context. So where is the colonialism standing here? That's my question. Okay, who wants to take this on? To add, I think that Gokta raised two really insightful points. The first about the, the rise of the far right and ultra nationalist populist movements, and that this is becoming really a global phenomenon. And that these regimes and these movements, which are very reactionary, are using the pandemic to their advantage and are also weaponizing homophobia in order to consolidate their power. And I think that we definitely see this on a global scale. And that was a salient theme in many of our presentations on this panel. And to the second point about colonialism, I agree completely with Jason, and we have to reckon with these uh, colonial histories and realities. I think the challenges in the context in which I work, sometimes the far left actually meets the right. So you have reactionary forces on the right who argue that you know, homosexuality is a Western phenomenon, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have forces on the far left arguing that there's a gay international sexual imperialist project that's trying to impose queer identities and subjectivities in the Middle East. And that further stigmatizes queer people in the region. So they end up mirroring a lot of the same talking points that we hear from the right. And that's been a huge challenge to do the kind of work that I do. So I think we need to be more nuanced. Yeah. Great. Um... Uh, Tani, do you want to respond? To, would you like to add anything to Ney? Uh, yeah, sure. I was actually just writing an answer for uh, one of the questions. Maybe I can uh, respond to that by Sana Ansari. Uh, so she's asking, I can actually understand the situation in Turkey very well. Queerness feels like a Western and European concept, tainting orthodox ideas, but don't you feel going digital is a sort of adaptation to not be able to express love? I mean, for the Turkey's case, obviously, AKP government's political homophobia is not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for many years, but the centralization of sex and sexuality uh, as part of a populist agenda uh, became one of the deciding topics of the past months. So we see it not only with the moral panic over the Netflix, but we see it with the Istanbul Convention. Uh, we see it with the LGBTQ pride discussion. So this moral panic and use of uh, populist and far-right uh, discourses uh, so, uh, on the other hand, about the digital, um, uh, so the, like, uh, the distinction between digital and the real or physical uh, proved to be a bit more complex. Obviously, scholars have been discussing this issue as well. Uh, but the interesting part for me was, because whenever we talk about digital spaces, we always, uh, at least we, meaning that like uh, people from the global south or uh, like Turkey, for example, we say global powers, regional and local uh, agency. So this is the general like discussion. But now I feel like as if AKP government read that literature, they are using the same discourse to target local LGBTQ by saying that you are part of the West. So therefore your regional acts are actually not counted and you are actually a failed term or not belong to the center uh, of this or the majority, let's say, of this country. 
it's a very interesting turn. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you all for uh, for the presentations. Yeah. Great. Well, our time is up, so I want to conclude simply by uh, uh, thanking you because your your very different presentation shed contempt complementary light on these processes for define and the struggles around defining what cultural membership looks like in different contexts. And we went from very local, the story of the plastic, you know, the most micro level to Jason documenting macro pattern. The one question I think we haven't had much time to talk about is religion and the question of the boundary between Christianity and non-Christian religion, which I think Islam is in the background of some of the presentation, but we didn't have a chance to, to really bring this up. But I want to thank again uh, Gocha for uh, having suggested that we have this joint event, which was, in my view, extremely stimulating. And I also want to thank the amazingly uh, uh, talented staff of the Weatherhead Center for bringing us together, Kathleen Hoover, Sarah Bantz, uh, Mick Laughlin and uh, Kristen Ca Caulfield. And um, uh, I think the next panel, uh, which is, you know, an at large discussion will be on November 4th, the day after the election. And uh, we have a really nice panel that includes um, Danielle Allen, uh, Tita Scotch, Paul. It's, it's a, it will be a really, really lively discussion of the aftermath of the, of the election, crossing fingers. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. And I really invite you to continue to exchange through private um, channels because obviously there's so much more to say about this. Do you want to add a word, Gachi? Yes, thank you so much for uh, letting us, um, inviting us to co organize this with you. I really enjoyed the papers. And uh, they were, uh, as Michelle said, they were really complimentary. We will be in touch in the next couple of days and uh, looking forward to the new events at the Weatherhead Center. <laughs>